and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Anna, and I'm here with my two friends, Will and Ant. Hi. Hello. This week, we're talking about the year 1933. Mm -hmm. And I'd like us each to give our three-word summaries. Will. Bang. Bang. Bang! (laughs) Okay, and now your three-word summary? (laughs) (laughs) He's just making noises again. I thought we said uh, one word times three. Is that that as it is yet? Anyway, they were three different bat types of bang. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, I've I've long been in favor of us loosening the restrictions on the three word summary. Mm. <laughs> so. Well, my three words are exactly three words, no more, no less. I've learned my lessons from the past what four weeks. This was like twenty five words. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not part of it. Oh, okay, okay. My three words are: it's all mine. It's all mine. Okay. okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Good. Legitimate. Mm-hmm. Legitimate. And I won't. Add a second backup three words that I would have done in the past that I've learned and I've been taught by the RNG to respect its rules. God, I love the cult that's forming around the RNG. It's not a cult, it's a way of life. Because you broke the rules two or three weeks ago, I think, didn't you? And you had a spell of extremely bad luck, which has been very coincidental so far. You've lost all, you've lost your fortune to to a game of chance. Yeah. That was true. I should not have gone all in on heads. (laughs) (laughs) Always bet on tails. You contracted plague. They are. That that was a terrible, the tarring and feathering, let me tell you. Yeah, suboptimal. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. What are your three words? My three (laughs) (laughs) My three words are, yay, booze again. Nice. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Which is how I also feel right now. <laughs> Late in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Decent amount of wine in that glass. All right. So uh, that being said, I think we all know exactly what we're talking about. Let's mm-hmm. uh, crack on. Nineteen thirty-three. All right. So today I'm kicking us off, and I'm going to talk about the end of prohibition in the United States. Woo-hoo. Yay! But before I talk about the end of it, I need to talk about the beginning of it, <laughs> uh, as as is customary with beginnings. And Why ends. did anyone think it was a good idea? Hmm. It's well, so dumb. Yeah. Well, Will, when's the last time you read the Bible? <laughs> Actually, you know what? Hold that thought because that is going to come up later. When he last read the Bible. <laughs> yes. Or is there some sort of quiz? No, this is this is a, a datum that I keep on all of you in my dossier <laughs> when the last time you read the Bible. Spoiler, I famously spoiler alert. Don't read. <laughs> Are you, yeah, of course you can't. And of course Aunt famously can't. No, it can't. No. Doesn't and can't read. Th- that's why I'm just a, you know, an oracle for the, the or- oral history of time. And that's uh, what yeah. I, I just go out there and get to these soothsayers and fortune tellers and stuff. Hence the game of chance. That explains a lot. Um, so, okay, let's talk about the beginnings of Prohibition. Prohibition, in case you don't know, is the, was the formal movement to end the sale and consumption of alcohol in the United States. Um, and campaigns against alcohol consumption existed since the very beginning of America, uh, though they really started to gain traction towards the end of the 19th century. America, of course, was founded by some quite pious Protestants and Mm. then other people. And that that Protestantism uh, has tended from time to time in America to rear its head with a with a like desire for some more pious and and holy behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Civil War kind of put a pause on prohibition movements because, you know, bigger fish to fry. Uh, But then as soon as that was done and America was totally fixed, uh, (laughs) (laughs) some very pious Protestants took up the cause again. They saw American society as beset by alcohol-related problems. And by the early 20th century, they had really started to gain gain, uh, some some ground. Uh, The main players in favor of restricting alcohol were called the Dries, and they were the Prohibition Party, the women, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and mm. the Anti Saloon League. Anti Saloon League. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. me- I do remember seeing a picture one time of these women. What are they called again? The Women's Christian Temperance Union. The Women's Christian Temperance Union. And yeah. they're holding a banner. It's a black and white photo. They're holding a banner that oh, yeah. says, No lips that touch liquor shall touch ours. Yeah, lips that touch liquor shall not touch mine. Yes. Yeah. And the picture of a, these women. They they weren't, you know, I would say spring chickens were not the word I would use to describe them. Yeah. I would say they're like autumnal 
Um, chickens. Chickens. <laughs> oh, <don't laughs> ch- chickens in their golden years. Mm, winter chickens, in their, maybe. In their dotage. And it's like, you know, it's, it's just, it could have made people double down. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so you're saying you read that sign and you thought, "Thank God, I'm immune." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, fair enough. I'll leave. I'll leave that to the judgments of history. Um, on the pro boo side, so the anti boo side was called the dries. What do you think the pro boo mm, side was the called? Soggies. <laughs> Just the wets. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. yeah. 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 Fine. Yeah. Uh, originally it was, there was a really vocal German American presence presence there because, uh, they were the base of the beer industry. Think about Anheuser-Busch mm. and some of the other big brewing companies in America. Duff beer. Yeah. Duff beer famously, uh, the beer of choice for nuclear engineers in Springfield. Um, <laughs> but with the outbreak of world war one, there was immense anti-German sentiment. Oh, okay. So the Wets yes. had to get some other champions from elsewhere in, in the booze industry, which mm-hmm. they easily found people to fill France, the gaps. They, you know, they, they love the French, right? <laughs> Everyone loves the French. Mm. Uh, and then it was just a really snobby movement. But why? About- I mean, I, I, the thing I just, that blows my mind continually, and I think yeah. this is something maybe I don't understand enough about the American yeah. psyche, not that that's a singular thing, but that... This could have been a conversation at all in a liberal Western country at yeah. this sort of time in history when well, everything is opening up largely. Like yeah. The vote is being given out more, like people are getting more civil liberties generally. And then it's like alongside yeah. that, it's stopping people drinking alcohol, which well, is a this pretty... Is, I mean, this is a thing that's really important to understand about America. And not that we need to get into this because there are a lot of people who can do this better than, than I can. But like, there has always been this incredibly religious bent mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. And it is, it's still a thing that exists today in our politics. And in fact, I have here in my notes, um, the, the movement against prohibition was, was largely driven by people who resented these rural Protestant religious values being imposed on urban America. Mm-hmm. And a hundred years later, that's like legitimately still yeah, what so a lot of the problem yeah. is. But that's not funny. So let's go. <laughs> Let me instead tell you some stories about prohibition. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry, we're at risk of educating the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would hate to get into some sort of like moral discussion about We do America. not want to get into the education podcast list. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. God, it would be horrible. Um, so just very quickly, in uh, 1919, prohibition was enacted with the passage of the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, let me guess which one that is. Yep. That is... Don't wear the same socks twice in two successive days. Correct. And also, you can't drink alcohol. Oh, That's okay. the one. <laughs> okay. Okay. It literally just says that, doesn't it? It's a twofer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it says something, you know, nicely more worded. Flowery more flowery Yeah, more, more flowery than that. Flora, flowery than that. Uh, it passed with, like, pretty significant majorities, 68% in the House, 76% in the Senate. It was wow. ratified by 46 out of 48 states. Wow. The two states that weren't in the Union at this time. Oh, Hawaii? Um, yep. Alaska. Yep. Ding, ding. Good job, Ann. <laughs> Suck it, Will. Come on, Will. <laughs> um, so then after, as soon as prohibition was enacted, you get things like the Volstead Act, which is the classic sort of enforcement mechanism. Think of your 1920s, oh, you yeah. know, your bootleggers, your Tommy guns, your, oh, yeah. your treasury agents coming in and busting up the speakeasies. Um, uh, but Obviously, as soon as prohibition was enacted, there was a pretty concerted effort against it. Um, I want to tell a couple of stories about prohibition. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, another classic American story is that members of Congress who wanted alcohol during prohibition could go to their own personal bootlegger, a man <laughs> named George Cassidy, also known as the man in the green hat. And he made up to 25 deliveries of booze a day inside Capitol Hill. And the Capitol Hill police allowed him in at all hours. Wait, so, like, was that just for the 20-something percent of people that voted against it? Or was that for the hypocrites that also voted for prohibition? The latter, Ant. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Cassidy estimated that he had helped 80% of Congress evade Jeez. prohibition regula- uh, restrictions. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yay, America. So now we come back to the Bible 
and uh, it always does. <laughs> as as, always was, as does. was ever thus. So organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and other Christian or- orgs had like been real drivers of prohibition, but they pretty quickly came to a problem, which is that the Bible mentions alcohol explicitly and yeah. a lot, including yeah, I mean, like the quite first miracle. famously, yeah, turning water into wine. Mm-hmm. So these people got around this little wriggle by just paying somebody to rewrite the Bible. And all, wow. all of a sudden, everyone was just drinking a lot of grape juice. Is that really true? Yeah. Like, and did they replace it with, was it a one for one? Like he turned yeah. water into grape, into grape juice. juice. Yeah, exactly. And that was the miracle. If, yeah. that, <laughs> if I was at a wedding and some guy came up and I got a magic trick for you and turned all my water into grape juice, like that's a rubbish, rubbish trick. Yeah. I'd rather wine. Like, I know. This is rubbish. Yeah, of course. That's insane that grape they Grape juice that. is just not good. And do they not see like, oh, we need to, you know, this, this, this book that we believe to be holy and true and right and, yeah. you, know, you know, indelible and immutable except when we want to change things. Yeah, because then you go back and you're like, well, did actually this, you know, Aramaic or Greek or whatever it was written in, did did that really mean wine or could it have just meant grape juice? Probably meant wine. Yeah, probably. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, two things. First of all, Turning water into grape juice is objectively easier because you just you just take <laughs> just a gra- some grapes you take seven water. or eight grapes in your hand and you cr- and you crush them into water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The grape one. juice. There's no and fermenting. No yeah. Fermenting. Whereas in the original miracle, Jesus had to have a flask of vodka up his sleeves. <laughs> had a flask, that he then a flask of vodka t- dumped into the. He cup. added it in, which, which isn't the, which isn't the traditional endorsed technique. Of course, That's, wine making wine. No, yeah, no, they don't no. just add vodka to grape Wait, juice. And also, it calls into question a little bit. I mean, maybe Jesus didn't turn the water into wine. <laughs> oh, oh, let's, oh. let's, 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 uh, ha- what, what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a little break here yeah, at yeah, headquarters. Yeah, yeah. So we can... RNG is very against. Sorry yeah. if I'm, so is that <laughs> blasphemy? I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, contravene well, the club blasphemy laws. <laughs> we're, we're all just going to contemplate our own faiths and we'll be back. Yeah. And we're back. Okay. Okay. So uh, here's my favorite story about prohibition is, uh, of course, much of the bootleg uh, alcohol came from Canada, where there was no prohibition. And the American Canadian border is famously sort of porous, yeah. and lots of valleys and whatever that you can Lakes. hide it in. Lakes. Uh, Edward, the Prince of Wales, which mm. I'm told is an important position in the British royal family. It really is. Uh, returned to the UK after a tour of Canada in the 1920s and shared a nice little poem that he'd heard with his father, the king. Four and twenty Yankees, feeling very dry, went across the border to get a drink of rye. When the rye was opened, the Yanks began to sing... God bless America, but God save the king. Hmm. Ah. Yeah, so your people, very so f- useful. Also famous, you know, their little ditty for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Um, Churchill, uh, he's famously loved having a pint of champagne at lunch. Uh, a and a pint of a champagne? A pint of champagne at lunch. Mm-hmm. These sell right. bottles. Yeah. And he'd have gin and tonic and he'd, he'd drink it. He'd various rituals for drinking, cigars, all that kind of stuff. But he one time traveled to the States and it was during Prohibition. And so he got a doctor's note saying that he absolutely had to be prescribed alcohol in these <laughs> quantities and these dosages every day. And yeah. so he was able to drink during yeah. Prohibition Time America because he was prescribed That's alcohol. incredible. Yeah. that I didn't know that Churchill did that. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. That was one of the loopholes was was yeah. b- getting prescriptions for it. Um, another loophole was... It's like, like my glyco- glaucoma. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're in the 20s. There's a lot of debate in modern scholarship about whether prohibition was actually successful. It's too much to get in here into here, but in short, it was a mixed success. There was a huge drop in consumption in the beginning, but gradually over time levels rose up until they were about 70% of original consumption yep. levels and then as soon as it's repealed within the next decade, it's back to normal levels and then keeps growing from there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Uh, The real thing that seems to have shifted the tide in favor of repealing prohibition was the Great Depression. So first of all, just a terrible time to be in America and Mm. many places in the world. Maybe some people wanted a little uh, beer to get them through. But state governments started to realize that they could really use that money. Mm. And in fact, up to 14 percent of federal, state and local tax revenues were from alcohol sales. Wow, 14 percent. Yeah. So they really needed that revenue stream back. And therefore, the the governmental resistance to prohibition starts to slowly crack. Mm, Yeah. Uh, Farmers were in favor of repeal because... 
if you're not making grain based alcohol, mm-hmm. you don't need the farmer's grain. Yeah, barley is right down. Barley's yeah, yeah. barley futures are well down. <laughs> and um hops, no point. <laughs> What even are they? You know, no one knows. Anyway, uh, by 1930, the Treasury was spending $13.4 million a year in a largely unsuccessful attempt to enforce prohibition. So this is the year after the great stock market crash, $13 million a year. A lot of money then. Mm -hmm. Um, In 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt made the repeal of prohibition a central point of his campaign, and he won. Mm -hmm. He carried through the promise, and in 1933, the 21st Amendment was ratified, which repealed prohibition. Up till now, it is the only amendment that exists solely to repeal a previous amendment, which is nice. It also lends itself helpfully to the mnemonic of 18th Amendment, you can't drink. 21, you can, because in America you have to be 21 okay, to drink. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Helpful. Uh, and then I love this. Uh, FDR, when he signed the act, said, I think this would be a good time for a beer, <laughs> which is just great. The ban on alcohol did continue in some states, even after the enactment of the 21st Amendment, because of the way federalism works. Can you guys guess which state was the last to fully undo prohibition laws? Oh, OK. Is it going to be New York, maybe? No, okay. it's got to be like a conservative state. You I think? I I think a large metropolitan, New York, like Alabama. Yeah, I'm going to go with um, South Carolina. Alabama, South Carolina, or New York. Or New York. Uh, You're both close-ish. It's Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So exactly for what you said. Mississippi didn't fully repeal them until 1966. Wow. So some some decades later. So hang on, was Prohibition still in effect in Mississippi for that song? Yeah. And in fact, to this day, there are still dry counties in states. Yeah. And sometimes if you're on a flight passing over dry counties i think this is less enforced now but it would it used to be a thing of like really? we have to take away your booze now we're entering into a dry state as oh. in the, the as in you're just transiting through the airspace yeah well and now i think it's like it doesn't make sense for counties because you you cover mm-hmm. that in t- 10 seconds when yeah, you're going yeah, yeah. 500 miles an hour or whatever but um the when it was when there were still dry states they would have to like take your booze away or wait to serve it to you until you had crossed through the state yeah so it's totally silly (laughs) uh and then just as one final postscript here the prohibition party still exists in the u.s today (laughs) although you know of course we don't really have a multi-party system Mm -hmm. but every year 20 or so people run on different (laughs) parties uh in 2020 the prohibition party which is this incredible combination of fiscally liberal but socially conservative, which <laughs> well, you wow. don't really see. That is so bizarre. Uh, they nominated the powerhouse duo of Phil Collins. <laughs> the Phil Collins. No, not that one. Uh, for president and Billy Joe Parker for vice president. And, Did they um, win? <laughs> it, uh, yes this is what trump was going on about that the election yeah. was stolen it Stop was, the it was stolen from them from the prohibition oh, party right. yeah 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 um would you like to guess how many votes they got nationwide mm. keep nationwide. in mind joe biden got 81 million votes i'm gonna say less than 200 okay no i reckon because they're not gonna be raised in all states right yeah there's like yeah they're, they're, they are they were not on the ballot in all yeah. states yeah for sure 4,000. Wow, Will, you're very close. The answer is 4,800. 4,834. Ah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and Phenomenal to think they got that, though. Oh, totally. And just as a comparison, though, so that was down from their high in 2016 of 5,600, uh, okay. but up from 2008 and 2012 when their tallies were only in the three digits. <laughs> and for comparison, Kanye, as you mentioned, yep. got 66,000 mm. votes did he re- in 2020. He did, 66,000. Yeah. Good and God. none of the above got 14,000. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they are they are less good than Kanye and none of the and above. No one. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's 1933 in the US, the repeal of prohibition. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a guy called Leo Szilard and the discovery of the nuclear chain reaction. Oh, interesting. Anna has her face. Sorry, I just got really excited because I think I wrote my master's thesis in part about him. Oh, no. Don't worry, it's fine. Oh, no. 
You're not going to get away with any of your usual lies, Will. (laughs) Terrible news, listeners. The good news is for you you is that I haven't thought about my master's thesis in seven years at this Mm. point. Okay, well, just extend that for another 10 minutes. Okay, yep, done. (laughs) Okay, so Leo Szilard lived from 1898 to 1964, and he was a Hungarian, German, American physicist and and inventor. And he was born in Budapest to a middle-class Jewish family. And as you might expect for a guy who then gained prominence as a physicist and an inventor, he'd spent a lot of time studying that and studying maths uh, when he was growing up. And then, like lots of people his age... Uh, as and as a reminder, he was born in 1898. He was caught up in the First World War, so he received notice uh, in in January 1916 that he had been drafted into the army. Mm. Uh, but then w- was told that he could continue his studies, uh, working or his, his studying as an, um, an engineering student. And then finally, he rejoined his regiment after officer training in May 1918. Okay. And then, uh, but in September, yep. he managed after be- before being sent to the front. Critically, he managed to catch the Spanish flu, which was going around at the time, and was sent for a, a spell in hospital. So, ba- and basically, that that saved his life because his regiment, he then found out later, was nearly uh, entirely okay. decimated wow. Wow. before the end of the war. So wow. the Spanish flu was a good thing that saved him, and yeah. therefore he could go on and do some good inventing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so he did engineering. You said. Well, he was a physicist and uh, just like a physicist primarily. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, he was a physicist primarily and a physicist secondarily. <laughs> what was he? Tertiarily? Ter- 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 uh, tertiarily a mathematician. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was his fourth biggest strength? <laughs> <laughs> Surviving Spanish flu. Surviving Spanish flu. Uh, he, he also, he was team into... Team player. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and interestingly, contemporary dance. Yeah. Okay. And... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't call it contemporary now, would we? No, you know, of course, no. But we, it, now we call it 90, 1920s 1980s. dance. Yeah, yeah, 1920s. He was yeah. a flapper girl. <laughs> he was a flapper. <laughs> <laughs> And and this was obviously in, well I I think this was very lucky for the world what the world because Szilard had just one of the most incredible brains uh, mm. of the twentieth century and potentially beyond that really so he did his doctoral dissertation on thermodynamics which ended up being praised by Einstein uh, and awarded top honors in nineteen twenty two and then um, he went on in this amazing career uh, so he in his he, he then wrote a paper which outlined these amazing important new ideas which I don't claim to understand like negative like things like negative energy entropy and helped, to, helped to found things like mm. information for theory which are just yeah. enormous, enormous fields yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and negative entropy is really important um you're building a uh a, a train or something and you, you don't, wow. no, don't don't send it don't send okay. it let, yep. let, nope. let him, nope. let him I, flounder I, I feel like I've, I've backed myself into a in a corner here but I'll go on. <laughs> Just let I, can, him. I can kill enough time here for all of us. Yeah, how long do we let him go? 45 minutes? 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah about okay. 45 minutes. I'm going to step back in. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and his career was, prop- was, was characterised by this propensity to dabble in things and help out other scientists. And he had one of the is, this ways of um, introducing new ideas to whoever he was working with. Mm. So he'd go and work with a prominent scientist on a particular issue and come up with, you know, 40 different amazing ideas and help them try and test out half like of those a, ideas. He was like mm. a human catalyst for things. Exactly. Yeah. So he would join up, he would sort of cross-pollinate ideas between cool. these other geniuses. But then, importantly, he would then, he would tend to not be the person uh, who would be, who would get the acclaim for them because oh, okay. he often didn't then be the, well, he wasn't the person who would actually write them oh, up okay, yeah, yeah. or be the lead experimenter okay. on them. But if you look for uh, behind a, a huge number of the Nobel Prizes and major advances from this time, in the background somewhere is Szilard and an idea from him and him okay. joining things up. I kind of like that, you know, it's like you can feel like you contributed to something but not actually do the work yeah you don't have to deal you don't have to deal with the like press conferences i say this all the time i'm all about the vision i'm not about the details you're an ideas guy i'm an ideas guy and no one's gonna look at your twitter and find things that you tweeted 10 years ago and they can if they want to there's there's nothing i think i think genuinely my twitter from 10 years ago there's something complaining about a train that was late and that's the only thing i ever tweeted okay Um, yeah no you're right you are like this guy um (laughs) (laughs) so the next, so one of the next things he did was that he was the first person to conceive of the idea of the electron microscope, mm. and he submitted.
invented the earliest patent for one in, in 1928. And then between uh, the same period, so 1926 to 1930, he worked with Einstein uh, to develop the Einstein refrigerator, which was notable because it had no moving parts. So l- later on, for instance, a guy called Ernest Lawrence received the, a Nobel Prize for a project that Szilard had been involved in. And Ernst Rusker ended up getting the one for the electron microscope in 1986 mm. uh, even though actually Szilard's original had arguably it was his original yeah, idea yeah. but he ended up not not bringing it about so um, and then and then in 1933 which is the year we're talking about he conceived of the nuclear chain reaction ah. and then later the following year he personally patented the idea of the nuclear fission reactor wow oh goodness and uh, it was later on in 1939 when Szilard wrote the letter which Einstein then signed, which initiated the, or made the case for the Manhattan Project, which uh, was the project that then built the atomic bomb, of course. And, uh, and and that idea, the nuclear chain reaction, was just the most phenomenally important mm-hmm. discovery and invention and idea for human for, for humanity in so many ways. And essentially, it's the idea that you, you can take some fissile material, you can slam it together... Uh, and you break it apart at atomic level. You release the energy that's be- be- at the between the atomic bonds, and then more material is released as well, which yeah, is yeah. more material, and it keeps going on and on and on until the material's exhausted. It's like almost <laughs> like a wow, chain, it's, chain reaction. It's, yeah, you, it's a nuclear chain reaction. That was an incredibly compelling uh, it's mass summary energy conversion, of isn't it? all of nuclear physics. Yeah, it's basically it, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you bang things together, small enough, more things chip off it, Smash they fly into stuff. other things, they bang into other things, and yeah. it just keeps going. Yeah. 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 And, then, like, and generally it works works with dense things like uranium <laughs> um and um and there's then that re- a your mom joke in there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> but i'm not gonna make it because i'm the better man well so <laughs> uh, and, and that's the, and that reaction clearly can be either, you know it can either be controlled in the context of a nuclear power plant yep. or it can be uh less controlled in the gods or used in, the, in, in an atomic bomb and 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 Szilard was just instrumental in getting it all to work properly so he initially helped to build the first big output from the manhattan project which was the chicago pile one which was the world's first artificial nuclear reactor mm. and he and that used natural uranium so that needed very very large quantities of it mm-hmm. rather than being refined and then uh, uh, later on helped obviously to develop the the nuclear weapons as well and i think we you know we look we look now on nuclear power so, uh, to some degree and certainly nuclear weapons as being <laughs> you know, mixed blessings at best. <laughs> mm-hmm. And perhaps I think some some of us look on nuclear weapons as being just a just a curse entirely. But the context at the time was that there were there were very, very genuine and well founded concerns that Nazi Germany would would master those technologies first. Yeah. And I think and, and thankfully, you know, we ne- we'll we'll never know what would have happened had Germany yeah, yeah. Uh, at the time under Hitler managed to master them in say nineteen forty four. But clearly I think my I, I probably most of us would argue if one side had to discover them, better that it's the US than Nazi Germany or even the Soviet Union, right? So, um, and at yeah, the time, the I stakes... Can, I, yeah, yeah the, the, not the, super controversial. The stakes were, yeah, the stakes were incredibly high because they, 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 they genuinely felt like they were in a race to get there first. Well... For me, uh, there's a lot going on in 1933, the build-up to World War II, uh, the Great Depression, all this kind of stuff hanging over Europe and the wider world. Yeah. So I'm going to focus on uh, the most important thing, which is the board game Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of these days you're gonna we're gonna think it's gonna be something extra villas monopoly, and you're just gonna hit us with with something really dark. Something yeah, huge. yeah, yeah. No, uh, the, the board game Monopoly very important in society. Yeah, we, we play it all the time together every day. <laughs> play it. Just best game. We do. We start all our recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Start the day every with a day. six hour yeah. board game that ends in tears. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, no, the, it can be traced actually back to 1903 to a house game that someone called Lizzie Maggie created. And Lizzie Maggie. Oh, Lizzie sorry. Maggie. Okay. Made up name. Never mm. trust someone with two first names. Mm, well, okay, Anna David. <laughs> 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 Which is your real name. Um, but it was created, and she was a pretty liberal, and she was staunchly anti-monopoly. She was quite left-wing socialist. Okay. Oh, okay. She, so she invented a game, and it was actually called at the time the Landlord's Game. And she invented this game, which tried to create an educational tool to explain 
the perils of uh, the exploitation of tenants by landlords mm. and to provide an education on the single tax theory that Henry George, uh, who was an economist and social reformer, posited. And the, the sort of Georgian uh, single tax theory was basically any derived additional income in excess of what was required to produce a good from the land uh, should belong to all members of society equally mm. and that these should be heavily taxed and therefore you can remove the tax burden on income tax, etc. The landlords should be paying the heft of this tax by freeing this up and therefore, um, you know, you could have some sort of universal social, you know, universal income and extra social welfare and stuff. I know there's something really important that you've just said, but anytime someone says the word tax, my, my head just fills with a sort of ringing and I can't get it out until, <laughs> are we done talking about taxes? We're done talking about taxes oh, for thank now. God. So Maggie actually made two versions of the rules, which is supposed to be, hey, look at what this utopia could be, mm. where we all play together, we share the proceeds and profits from, oh. our, from our land that we share, and we all win the game together. <laughs> but and that one didn't sell. She made another one, which is a stern, anti-monopolistic version, uh, where you you had to generate a monopoly, gather wealth, and crush your opponents in a fit of capitalist excess. So only one of these versions was fun. <laughs> Uh, she later patented it in 1923 and all this was self-published by her as just her and her friends and stuff like that. But at a dinner party one time in her house, uh, a friend of the family, a guy called Charles Darrow, played it. And they played the unfun version, they played the fun version. They had a great time, they played it for hours. Um, and he's like, where, where are the rules for this? You know, where is it? Like, oh, it's just in my head and all the rest. Oh, write them down. So she wrote them down and gave them to him. He... Uh, he then keeps those rules and he decides to publish a board game himself. Mm. Not the landlord's game, but a game called Monopoly. So he effectively semi-stole the... Like, yeah. he, he basically stole yeah. the idea. Yeah, mm. it doesn't sound like there was a lot of, you know... I'm no. sure he wasn't cutting her a deal on the back end. You could effectively say that he monopolized wow. the publishing uh -huh. of this board game. <laughs> I think you could effectively say that he landlords game. <laughs> he absolutely did. <laughs> um, so that was in uh, yeah in 1933. It started coming out, uh, sort of widely done. the The Parker brothers yes. then went on to buy the rights from Darrow. Okay. And uh, there was a bit of shenanigans though, because they actually uncovered at the time in 1933 or 30, 30, 32 beforehand that there was another co-author of this with the patent in 1923 that was relevant to them, the landlord's game. And so they went to Lizzie Maggie and they offered her the princely sum of $500 for the rights to the original patent. In 1933. 32-ish. 32-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Which they got. But... Um, uh, they they then basically they released this. Barrow had it released in 1933. They released it in 1935, just in time for Christmas. Became a huge success, and then it attracted a lot of attention in lawsuits with people claiming they invented this game and mm. stuff because it's such a big thing. Yeah. And they settled them all out of court. But what was interesting in here is because they sort of positioned that Darrow was a sort of like during the Depression invented this game to have a bit of fun and wonder what it's like to be rich and that kind of stuff dealing with fake money. Yeah. And they had this sort of mythos in the marketing and they effectively just wrote Lizzie Maggie out of the history books completely, uh, even though they knowingly actually bought out the patent. They and Rosalind stuff. Franklined her. They they did. I don't know what that means, but they did. <laughs> she, she's the woman who discovered DNA alongside Never Watson heard of and her. Crick. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly the point. Yeah, exactly. Um <laughs> So they kept this all under wraps till about the 70s when another lawsuit came up against uh, against them and they uncovered the sort of true history of Lizzie Maggie as well. So she was sort of found out about. Um, I've got a couple of cool facts to sort of round this out. Yeah. So. Guess, Fact one, Monopoly is terrible. <laughs> it is a terrible board game. I'm so sorry. Um, but there is an original board game from 1933 the oldest surviving version of Monopoly. Ooh. How much do you think it was sold for? It, it did include the whole set. When was I, it sold? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. You mean actually. like sold at auction? At auction, yeah. Okay. It had a round board, cardboard houses, it had like rules for rent increases, etc. Hmm. <sighs> People get really into this mm, sort of they thing. They really do. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's got to be... A hundred thousand. I would 000. say four hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand. It is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. <gasps> yeah, Yay. Good. a little well bit done. of change. Yeah, it's from nineteen thirty-three. Um, yeah. Uh, also, it was me. I bought it. it. You, I you it. bought it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've forgotten. Um, also, in nineteen forty-one, the British Secret Intelligence Service 
had uh, a version of the game manufactured in the UK to create a special edition for World War II prisoners of war held by the Nazis mm. and hidden inside these. Because it wasn't tough enough for them. They, <laughs> they, they made them this. play Monopoly. Well, they might not even have played it and still have benefited from it because it had hidden maps, ah. compasses, real money and other objects used for escaping. Probably just the board game itself because that's great. <laughs> um, and they're distributed by a fake charitable organisation spun up by the British Secret Service. That's pretty cool. In order to sort of like, hey, we're handing out some welfare vouchers and stuff like that. And yeah. lo and behold, it was like, you know, escape from prison DIY kits. I like that's that so a cool. lot. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, other few things. I've got another couple of quizzes for you. Mm-hmm. You ready for some hot fire questions? Yeah, yeah. I want them. Woof. What city was the original s- set based on? Atlantic City. Atlantic City? Uh, it sounds like Anna knows that. Mm-hmm. So... I'll say New York to be different. You're wrong. It's Atlantic City, New Jersey. Yay! (laughs) Obviously she knew that. (laughs) Suck it. This this is going to be kind of a two-parter, a twofer. Okay. All right. Which of these were never a Monopoly token? So I'm going to give you three options. Ooh, okay. And one of them was never a Monopoly token. Great. So you have a (laughs) T-Rex. Great. A rubber duck. Okay. Or a wallet. So which which one of them? Which one of them was not was a not a token? token? I well, would I, say, I would. Well, you can go first if you want. I'm gonna go with wallet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was also gonna say wallet just because it's such an uninspiring shape. It'd be like, mm-hmm. oh, here's my little square. Yeah. I'll move it around. But to be not the same, I'll say rubber duck. Uh, you should have gone with your gut. It was indeed wallet. It was yeah. never a token. Yeah. Uh, the total list of tokens. Um, what would you remember? What would you recall as being tokens, actually? Uh, there's a top hat. Yeah. There's a horse. Yeah. I always played with the horse. There's yeah. a... There's a shoe. A, a terrier of some kind. Yeah. All those things no longer exist. You're just very old. They oh, were all no. retired in 2016 or earlier. Oh, no. Oh, wow. Now, is yes. it just like a little Kim Kardashian yeah, figure? Yeah, so they've got new ones a like T-Rexes phone. and stuff like that. And the horse has been gone for years and years <gasps> and years. No. Um, oh, wow. But the total list is battleship, race car, top hat, boot, thimble, iron, cannon, lantern, purse, rocking horse, Scotty dog, wheelbarrow, horse and rider, sack of money, cat, penguin, rubber duck, and T-Rex. Um, okay. And the current, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's, the battleship still survives, but a lot of the ones that we associate with being there is they're gone. Oh, good! I'm glad board. the military industrial complex has yeah, retained exactly. its position in the Monopoly <laughs> token. Hierarchy. But also, Monopoly is the kind of thing where a family will buy it and it'll be there for thirty oh, or forty years, yeah. right? Yeah. It'll just hang around in a yeah, cupboard yeah, somewhere. Yeah. yeah, like it's not like people are old if they yeah, exactly. haven't bought their Monopoly this year. Well, and then you, you do have to choose tokens that will stand the test of time. Mm. You can't be like, and now there's a fidget spinner. Because yeah. you know, yeah, 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 10 true. months later, people are going to be like, what the hell is this? No, they're going to last forever. I've got a big collection of them. <laughs> they're going to be for sale yeah, for 120000 in about 50 yeah. years' time. You and your pogs and your <laughs> yeah. fidget spinners. Beanie babies. Uh, <laughs> beanie babies. Uh, final... Final fact. Okay. Right. How many world championships oh. of Monopoly have been held? God. How many world how, championships? How many? Like what? way too many. Is 15 the is the answer. 15. 15? 15. 15. Only 15. Oh. And the last one was held. Surprising. In 2015, actually. Okay. So it's not been, happened since 2015 in Macau and is won by Niccolo Falcone of Italy, where he won a 20k purse. And he got a quick lead with orange monopolies, which was his tactic. And he has some advice for any would-be Monopoly players out there. He says, purchase all the railroads. He says that's the way to win. Railroads. Um, and his favourite part about Monopoly, apparently, is taking people's money and making deals, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that is a, I would say, a crucial component. I mean, what Monopoly. kind of human being <laughs> attends and takes part in well, the Monopoly you, World Championships? How, how, many, how many tens of thousands of dollars have you won doing something that you love? <laughs> Good point. How much? How many tens of thousands have we made from this podcast? Oh, We're so at, many. To we we shouldn't discuss club yeah, business yeah, outside yeah, the club yeah, board yeah. meetings. Yeah, yeah. This is for the financial committee. Uh, so sadly, though, a championship that was planned for 2021 had to be cancelled because uh, some big event happened that year. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Who can um, but hopefully, hopefully, next year or two, we're going to see the next world championships. That's the year 1933. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. That is everything you'd ever need to know about 1933. If you have questions or comments or would like to sponsor our entry into the 2022 Monopoly <laughs> Tournament of Champions, you can find us online on Twitter, on Insta, at our website, randomlygeneratedhistory.com. Yeah, please uh, like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and tell your friends. I mean, that's the most important thing you can do out of anything else. Yep. Uh, just tell a friend or two and just be like, hey, I've got this cool podcast. It's called Randomly Generated History. That's what you're listening to right now. Uh, so it's actually that. not the name of the podcast. What, what's it called again? Do you know the randomly generated <laughs> you know history club? <laughs> I do know where I am. I'm here with you two, my two friends, Wall and Ona. <laughs> I hit my head. Um, but anyway, now it's time to choose our next year. So, Will, as always, can you please dust off the trolley, extract the paddles, and don the random number generator on your chain. Of course, Ent. And Put on the ceremonial hat. And as a reminder, the random number generator is set to choose, to choose a year between 1000 BCE and 2000 CE. Mm-hmm. Except in those circumstances, as we discovered <laughs> recently, yeah. Yeah, when yeah, it is yeah. hijacked by board members uh, when they exercise their right to do so, which we respect. And... The next year is... <laughs> 1066! No way. No, yes way. come on. No yep. way. Prove it. There we go. Oh, yeah. Wow. 1066. Oh, that's, my um... God. Okay, I'm going to say it right now. Shotgun Norman invasion. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> did anything else happen in 1066? I'm all over the Battle of Hastings. Oh, well, we God. did learn that, the, that Halley's oh. Comet... Halley's was comment. Spotted in 1066. Comment? Halley's comment. Yeah. Comment. Halley's, comment. Halley's comment. Yeah. 1066. Yeah. That's the uh, uh, shotgun battle of Stamford Bridge. <laughs> like generally, you search for 1066 in Google, you just get Battle of Hastings. That's yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, that's the big one. That's it. Like, what am I going to do? You shotgun the two good things. Um, ice cream invented, maybe. I feel like that could be a good one. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next week for the Norman invasion, the Battle Andy. of Stamford Bridge, and ice cream. 